Now there is that leadership. Baba Bakian, chairman of the Revolutionary Communist Party, has dug into and evaluated the first wave of communist revolutions, <coughs> beginning in the Soviet Union from 1917 until 1956, and China from 1949 until 1976. These were the first attempts to build societies free from exploitation and oppression and achieve amazing things against incredible obstacles. They opened a new chapter in human history, but these revolutions also had serious shortcomings and problems. Avakian summed these lessons, positive and negative, up, to sum up the lessons of these revolutions and drawn from broad spheres of human experience and intellectual and scientific endeavor. He's developed a new synthesis of communism, and what this means is that there really is a viable vision, a strategy, and leadership for a radically new and much better society, a world in which human beings can truly flourish. Now, the principle of vanguard leadership stands in stark contrast to notions of horizontalism that have a great deal of currency in the Occupy movement and in other social movements. Horizontalism is a concept that takes in different ideas of decentralized, consensus-based decision-making, of movements without leaders, and the distrust or outright renunciation of state power of any kind. The question is posed, why can't we all be leaders or have no leaders? Why can't there be a level playing field in which everyone's opinion has equal merit? Why can't you chart a movement and its direction based on mass democratic consultation? The simple and the complex answer is that we live in class society, in a society in which the economy, the educational system, and the media are controlled by the capitalist ruling class. A society in which people are systematically lied to about major events in which those on the bottom are locked out of the realm of working with ideas, while only a relative minority has that training and has that advantage. You can decree that everyone can equally decide a matter, but the basis for doing so is profoundly unequal. And what about consensus-based decision-making? Look, in Egypt you had this incredible upsurge last year and it continues. But at its height, within the movement of youth and those who had joined from throughout society, if you took a poll and democratically decided how to approach the Egyptian military, the majority would have told you that the army was a force for the people, or at least a force not arrayed against the people. But this was plain wrong. The truth of the matter is, despite the phraseology of leaderlessness, Different class and social forces were fighting for their programs and exerting disproportionate influence in all of these movements. The question is not leadership or no leadership. The question is, will there be leadership that can lead the people to affect really fundamental change, change that can satisfy their highest aspirations, or will there only be change, though it may even seem dramatic at times, that in fact leaves the system untouched, the oppressive foundations of society? unchanged. The need for vanguard leadership is not something that communists concoct to create a gap between themselves and the rest of society. These gaps already exist. The need for a vanguard is a reflection of the division of society into classes along with the division between mental and physical labor and the need to overcome that. It is a reflection of the fact that the most fundamental interests of the broad majority of society, and especially those on the bottom, lie in striving to abolish all oppression and exploitation through revolution, but people do not spontaneously gravitate to that understanding. The need for vanguard has to do with the very enormity of remaking society and changing people's thinking. In late November, Avakian issued a statement about the Occupy movement. He talked, and it's here, about its overwhelmingly positive thrust, but he also points out that the idea of horizontal organization as a means of major social change or a model of a different society does not measure up to the reality of what is actually required to fundamentally uproot and transform a society and world marked by and grounded in profound inequalities. The revolution we are talking about is aimed at doing away with oppressive divisions of race or nationality, gender and sexual orientation, with divisions between a large and overcoming the divisions between a large and broad layers of a middle class with some privileges and the tens of millions, especially those in the inner cities and the immigrants whose conditions of life are quite different. And you need a vanguard leadership to apply a correct strategic orientation, program and organization in order to address these contradictions and inequalities as part of advancing the cause of revolution. 
Now, vanguard leadership comes under comes under attack for being elitist, as though communists revel in being a minority who think that the masses are too stupid to know what they want and need. But Lenin actually insists on the opposite. There is both the necessity and the ability for the masses of people to understand the basic dynamics of objective reality and in particular of human society in order to consciously struggle to transform it. The purpose of a vanguard is to arm people with that understanding precisely to enable the masses themselves to make revolution, not to substitute for them. In other words, it's not that there is some zero-sum game where there is a vanguard, there is a less initiative on the part of the masses. No, where there is a genuine vanguard, where there is a genuine vanguard to arm people um, with the understanding of society and the world, that makes it possible for people and the, the masses of people for themselves to make revolution and not to be substituted for it. This is what I'm saying. Where there is a genuine vanguard, it becomes possible to unleash conscious activism of the masses so they can change the world in their highest interests. This is even more the case in socialist society. And this brings me to the concluding part of my talk. Some theorists whose work has been referenced by the discourse of horizontalism have spoken of breaking with doctrines of power over society. In response, I want to reference Baba Vakian on state power. And this is what he says. Power is not a dirty word. In fact, in the hands of the proletariat is a very good thing. Power, speaking in political terms, means the ability to implement a program, most essentially the ability to make decisions affecting the overall course of society, the ability to determine the direction of society. When we talk about the dictatorship of the proletariat, we are talking about power increasingly residing with the masses of people to make radical transformations in their interests and ultimately in the interest of humanity as a whole. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the dictatorship of the proletariat. This is the passage. Why should we not want power to liberate society and humanity and to enable us to become caretakers of the planet? Let me state it differently. What is so righteous about not wanting to get rid of this state power with all the misery it produces and perpetuates? Socialist revolution establishes a new state power that suppresses old and new exploiters. It creates new governing institutions that increasingly draw the masses into the administration of society and the further transformation of society towards the abolition of all oppressive relations. Socialist revolution establishes a consciously planned economy serving the emancipation of world, of world humanity and the preservation and enhancement of the ecosystems of the planet. And socialism is also a society in transition to communism, to a world without classes and class distinctions. Now, the Revolutionary Communist Party has issued this constitution for a new socialist uh, republic in North America. And this is nothing less than a framework, a whole new framework for a society, for an emancipatory socialist society, how it would be constituted, and how it would function. And I encourage people to get this document. What the Constitution is talking about immediately, an end to all wars of aggression and torture, the dismantling of the whole network of international exploitation and plunder, immediate steps towards tackling global warming and implementing socialist sustainable development, complete access to abortion, all around struggle against patriarchy, and the creation of a liberating societal framework for struggling against and transforming all oppressive gender relations, including the oppression of gays, lesbians, and transgender people. An immediate end to the criminalization, demonization, and police brutality against black and Latino youth, an end to the hunting down and persecution of immigrants. This will be a state power that makes common cause with the oppressed of the world. The Constitution talks about the dynamic between communist leadership and the broad masses of people under socialism. You need leadership to carry this revolution forward to ensure that power is not lost. But you are also unleashing a process of fitting the masses to rule society, enabling them to take greater responsibility for the direction of society, to critically analyze what direction it is actually going in. You are working to break down the division between mental and physical labor and between leadership and lead. The party will be leading the state and its key institutions. But in that framework, there will be incredible diversity, dissent, and initiative. 
on a scale unseen and unimaginable in any capitalist society or any previous socialist society. The Constitution talks about things like communications, where funds will be allocated for the state meter, media, which will promote the policies of the socialist state, but also open the airwaves to dissenting voices. And funds will be allocated to media independent of the state, and self-generated media will flourish. Will there be Occupy-type movements, occupy movements in this socialism? Yes, and double yes. We're talking about protest and upheaval far beyond what we have witnessed here, perhaps around women's emancipation, environmental policy, political structures. And rather than being penned and, re and repressed, this kind of contestation will be part of the very fabric of society. Because you have to be interrogating society as you transform it. Because dissent is a crucial part of the process of getting to the truth of things, of learning about and acting on the shortcomings and defects of socialist society. Because this kind of contestation and experimentation enables people to be exposed to and to thrash out various ideas, viewpoints, and programs because leadership does not have a monopoly on truth. A guiding principle of the new society and state power is solid core with a lot of elasticity. There must be a continually expanding force in society convinced of the need to, convict, to advance to communism through all the difficulties and obstacles. And on the basis of this, there needs to be maximum elasticity, diversity, people going off in different directions. It's not about everybody thinking the same thing or everybody marching in single file. It's about a rich and multi-level process of getting to a new world learning, experimenting, and discovering new things. It's about getting to a future where people can finally live as human beings and where ultimately humanity can move beyond the need for states and institutionalized leadership. This is our answer to horizontalism. Thank you. I have never used the word horizontalism. So this was a wonderful uh, challenge to me, to come here and defend something, that a word I have never used. But I, you know, I, I love this kind of challenge, because then I have to interpret what horizontal. You know what horizontalism means. I'm not sure what it means, but I, we'll, we'll, we'll work with that. Uh, let's see. I, I want to write down what I would like to do, which I know I'm not going to do. Uh, first, I, I'll mention something else. Um, in order to prepare for this event, uh, I, I went to Google. See, it's obligatory these days. And I, I wanted to know what Ray, Ray Lotta thought about the revolutionary state, although I've heard you speak before. So I searched uh, the terms Ray Lotta and revolutionary state. This is what I got. <coughs> Revolutionary lotto system for guaranteed win. <laughs> this is true. It was right up at the top. Say that again, please. Guaranteed lotto system for guaranteed win. And you see, there are many references to that system. Lotto. Lotto. I don't know. Google is crazy like everything. Uh, so, but, but I believe in objective chance. I, I'm influenced by surrealism. So I think there's a. I, I just like horizontal. You gave me the term horizontalism to defend, so I'm going to defend it. I think the real theme of my talk is revolutionary lotto system for guaranteed win versus horizontalism in both cases arbitrarily uh, handed to me. But what I would like to talk about are presuppositions maybe the problem although we've heard a little bit about the problem um, horizontalism how do you spell it? Uh, <laughs> In, in the sense that I think it will be meaningful to you. And I, I'm really going to defend it with, with all my heart. The, the tradition of horizontalism that I identify with. The system of domination. And how the state fits into it. 
And then the thing that I really want to talk about more than anything, and I, if we don't get to it at the beginning, I hope we can get into it a lot, and I recommend this book about the Common Ground Collective, which uh, developed after Hurricane Katrina in, in New Orleans. Uh, started by my old friend of 25 or 30 years, Malik Rahim, who, who has worked on grassroots issues for many, many years. Practice, and not long-term practice in the future, in utopia, or in heaven, or in some transcendent realm beyond history, but practice today, which to me is really the question. How does a certain ideology, a certain imaginary, or a certain practice relate to your life today, and where is it going to lead? And in order to know that, you have to think very critically. So one of the things I wanted to say about presuppositions is, by the way, I really like this guy. <laughs> uh, I have big differences on politics, but I am, in a sense, a Hegelian Marxist. Philosophically, I have to admit it. I'm also uh, uh, a lot of other things that may conflict with that. Uh, but I, I believe in dialectical thinking. I believe in critique. And interpreted in, in, in a broad sense, I'm completely satisfied with historical materialism, uh, maybe as developed by people like uh, Walter Benjamin and others later, he amended from the classical form. Uh, in a certain sense, I think uh, what I really wanted to do was an, an anarchist critique of horizontalism and a Marxist critique of the revolutionary state. So let's see if we can do that. Uh, Marx said we have to engage in the, re the ruthless critique of all things existing, including ourselves, including ideologies like anarchism and Marxism, the revolutionary state, and everything else. Uh, Marx raised the crucial question of who will educate the educators, which to me is a very crucial sense. We can have lots of ideology about this, but people exist in real historical circumstances. Uh, with real historical character structures, with a legacy, you know, that nightmare that weighs on the, the chest of the, the living. Uh, the, the, the weight of history is like a nightmare weighing on us. That's the weight of history. It's the weight of institutions, of the imaginary. That we, and the, I, I like to talk about four spheres of determination. And uh, I shouldn't, I mean, my writing's terrible, but I, uh, institutions are one, ideology is another, imaginary is another, and ethos is the fourth. And uh, that's basically what I use in all social analysis. If any of those are neglected, for instance, if you're handed an ideology without looking at, you know, we have the problem of the transition in Marxism and in revolutionary thought. If we're really going to have a transition to anything, we have to look at what the institutional structure is and how you can have institutional structures that get where you're going. What is the dominant ideology or what is even the revolutionary alternative ideology? Ruthless critique of that. What is the imaginary, which is seldom considered, we can talk about it, and, and the ethos. I really want to talk about the ethos. I really, you know, we may not do this, but please, I would love to talk about the difference between the actual practice of the RCP in New Orleans, which, you know, I worked with the RCP uh, on several projects. But what was the practice post-Katrina, post-oil spill? You know, what is the practice that comes out of a certain ideology of the revolutionary state? What is the practice, practice that comes out of, of a competing view of reality, which I identify with anarchism, we could call it horizontalism or a lot of other things. It has very concrete consequences for practice, and I, I'd like to analyze those very carefully. Okay, what else? Uh, I don't want to say too much about theory. I believe that a phenomenon consists of its history. I, I've already kind of pointed that out. Uh, ideology explains away the history of a phenomenon. Many people can look at the history of capitalism and see where we've gotten, but they also have to look at the ways in which alternatives to capitalism, proposed alternatives, are conditioned by capitalism and by the system of domination and how difficult the project is of, of transcending that determination. 
Uh, I believe in the negation of the negation. Mao criticized that. Avatian criticized it. Uh, it's a basic dialectical concept. Uh, negation is reactive in many ways in the social world. People react to capitalism by, in many, well, Marx wrote about it uh, in his 1844 manuscripts. He talks about crude communism which is a mere reaction to capitalism. You have to negate the negation and keep ne negating the negation. In other words, be ruth ruthlessly critical. I think that's very important. Uh, let me get in, into the, the main topic. There is a history of what I would call free community. Uh, anarchism, Communitarian Anarchism, this is a book I have coming out probably later this year on Communitarian Anarchism, which is probably the most detailed version of it I've put together. I have this pseudonym who writes different kinds of work. The Chicago Surrealists are going to be publishing that book probably next month. Uh, there's a history of free community. In a certain sense, what's called horizontalism is nothing new for human beings. For 99% of human history, people lived in tribes and people lived in villages. People did not live under the systems of domination that prevail today. We can debate that if anybody's interested. Uh, one of the most transformative experiences in my life was to spend 10 years uh, working with the Papuan people. Papua is the second largest island on the planet. Uh, a large transnational corporation called Freeport McMoran was headquarters in New headquartered in New Orleans and was committing ecological um, ecocide, let's say, and cultural genocide in alliance with the Suharto dictatorship. And I got involved in the struggle of the Papuan people against the Indonesian dictatorship and corporate capitalism, basically. Uh, one of the things that I really believe in is learning from people learning from, the, I've, and since then I've worked with Tibetans a lot. Uh, I've done a lot of work in South Asia. Uh, what many people said from Common Ground, inspired by anarchist thought, is we have to learn from the people in the neighborhood. You know, there's a lot there. Uh, we don't have to bring them our ideology as if, well, there were a couple of terms, to fit them uh, Fitting them, fitting the masses uh, for the struggle. There's a dialectic with, between theory and practice, but there, throughout the world, there is an embodied practice that we can learn from. Ecofeminists, if any of you, I hope you can go to some of the ecofeminist uh, panels. Uh, the caring labor of indigenous people, traditional people, and women throughout the world, in a sense, is communism. Is is the practice of communism. We talk about the commons a lot today. Uh, the, the communitarian anarchist view is there is a lot there to work with. There is a huge heritage that we should not transform. The classical theorists, both anarchists and, and Marxists, wanted to wipe out much of that and recreate the world. It was a very Eurocentric project, which has now been taken to Asia and everywhere else in the world. We have to learn from people in South Asia. We have to learn from Papuan people. We have to learn about their traditions. We have to learn about the gift economy we have to learn about other types of exchange. We have to learn about care. I'll digress, because I'm never going to get through that. <laughs> um, you know, I've worked, I work with Common Ground. I, I worked with a small group after Hurricane Katrina. We actually called it Common Ground in the Ninth Ward, uh, which was a devastated area. Uh, the short time that I worked with them, I moved on to working with other uh, grassroots groups. Uh, if any of you have read the story, which is told in Scott Crow's book, uh, Common Ground worked all over the city. I worked with them. Uh, I worked with another group that he mentions called the Soul Patrol in the Seventh Ward. Mama D was the leader of that group, neighborhood leader. Uh, the basis for our work was to re rebuild people's communities, not to teach the people, we, of course, we wanted to bring theoretical concepts that perhaps were not alive at that point, uh, but to work with the tradition. For, for instance, the traditions of mutual aid in communities in New Orleans, the traditions of self-help. 
there's a lot to work with. This is what I've found all over the world. Just to get to the point about uh, working with the RCP. The model that the RCP brought in was, was outside organizing, basically. That, that you know, We heard a lot about the new constitution for the future. Uh, we, we saw a lot of newspapers being so. The idea was not to start a newspaper in the neighborhood, which is what Common Ground was doing. Starting communications projects for the neighbors. Creating solidarity within the neighborhood. There was really no relationship between the RCP and its ideology and what was going on in the neighborhood. It's a big difference. Uh, Larry Everest and a few other people uh, developed something called the Emergency Committee after the oil spill. It was very interesting to see the differences in process between Common Ground or Occupy and the Emergency Committee process. The Emergency Committee process was all top down. It was hierarchical. Particularly, there was one event that I found to be very telling. Um, the meeting was called the Unitarian Church. It wasn't a huge audience, maybe 50 people, but a lot of community activists. Uh, basically, a group of people had decided on an agenda before the meeting that a certain statement of principles would be adopted. And there was a concerted effort to put aside all other business and not listen to local people so that that statement of principles would be adopted, a press conference could be held, and it could be announced, and it could be used for further organizing. And two things in particular interested me. There was one organizer uh, who's been very active in Occupy since, who started raising issues about health and issues about maybe doing other things that were immediately needed in the community. Larry said something very interesting to her. He pointed to her and said, you are unprincipled. <laughs> That's what he said, you are unprincipled, which is a wonderful concept because anarchy means archos, in, it, it, it means principle in Greek. So in a certain sense, in the sense of principles which dominate people, ideological principles which get in the way of community, we're against principles. But it wasn't a nice thing to say to this nice middle-aged lady organizer. You are unprincipled. And then later in the same meeting, another organizer, I think from the coast, who worked with Cajuns and Indians and so forth, raised the same kind of issues. And he silenced her. And she started walking out because she gave up. And as, he, as she was walking out, he pointed to her and said, you are unprincipled. And this is not the way we do it. <laughs> this is not the way we do it in Common Ground. It's not the way we do it in Occupy. It's not the way we do it in any of our anarchist groups in New Orleans, Iron Rail, uh, Crescent City, anti-authoritarians. We are trying to develop grassroots, participatory, democratic processes. And there's another dialectical concept that's very important. I'm throwing out most of this history I, I wanted to tell you about. But uh, there's a principle that, that goes back to Hegel. It runs through Marx to a certain extent. Uh, Slavoj Žižek, who's not popular with some people in this room, has been talking about it again. Uh, it's the concept of ethical substance or ethical substantiality. And in Hegel, Hegel made this distinction between the moral and the ethical. If you want to hear a little philosophy, I'll throw out some philosophy. It's been important in, in the history of revolution. Uh, morality for Hegel, moralite he called it, was a dream. It's what people who don't like utopia say about utopia. That it's just some dream that is not connected with reality. Well, the ethical is, I'll wrap it up very quickly. Uh, the ethical is related to what exists in society. And Hegel's idea was, in order for something to be meaningful, a non-idealist, you know, to use a term that he wouldn't have used, in a, in, a, in a derogatory sense, this is what Marx picked up, of course, in historical materialism. He threw out the idealistic element of Hegel and he kept this idea of ethical substantiality. You must build on what exists and develop it. So that the question is what kind, you know, who will educate the educators? 
ultimately we have to become the kind of educators who can educate ourselves. And we have, we have to have communities of people who are capable of acting responsibly and democratically and exercising collective leadership, which is what <coughs> Occupy is really about. Uh, I stopped going to most of the General Assembly meetings. I still go. But we started a Solidarity Economy Committee, which I co-coordinate uh, within Occupy. And, uh, you know, we're studying ideas about land trust communities, labor exchanges, uh, worker self-management, and other projects which would be a step in the direction of creating ethical substantiality, creating a movement which has a practice, which does not rest primarily on ideas, but rests on the transformation of people, the transformation of practices, the transformation of our own communities, institutions, creating systems of ideas, but also creating a new imaginary so people can imagine controlling their own communities, exercising agency within their own communities. This is what it's about. The reason why, and I had a, a really good quote from Marx, by the way, in, in the critique of the Gotha program, he ridicules the idea of the so-called free state, which his opponents were advocating. This is what he says, and I, I agree with him completely, uh, maybe with one reservation, let's say. Freedom consists in converting the state from an organ superimposed upon society into one completely subordinate to it. Uh, anarchism is the critique and overcoming of all forms of domination. The state is one of those. Anarchism does not say, by the way, that there, you can never do anything through the state. Uh, it's possible that you might be able to do something through the state, but the question is, how can the state be entirely subordinated to society? It seems to me it's either by abolishing it or by dealing with it in ways that we have not yet discovered. And if they're possible, we're going to have to develop them. In other words, we would have to have that sphere of ethical substantiality so that the state would, in effect, be a tool of society and allow society to abolish it. None of the projects of Leninism have ever really taken that project seriously. You know, that dilemma has never been faced. The result has been mythology. The result, I think, has been Holocaust denial. Uh, systematic distortion of reality, which is the definition of ideology. It has not worked. I, we, I don't even want to debate that, because I don't debate Holocaust denial. Uh, I just say read. Find out read a lot of things from different points of view. Uh, but I guess that's why I would be for horizontality or whatever it's called. <laughs> okay. okay. So we've got five minutes for response from any of our speakers. All right. Um, I'm used to a, a, a no, pen. pens are good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm used to a, a, a podium that can hold more uh, paper. Um, you know, look, John uh, sort of ranged widely over no, no, this is ranged widely. It was an archive. And, uh, well, you know, there was some focus. There was focus. You, know, you ranged widely, but there was focus. Um, here are some points I want to make. One, you know, conspicuously missing in you know his comments and his analysis was any sense of how to transform society you know, societally. That is, there is an integrated, unified capitalist economy. The United States, you know, is an imperialist power. You know, it has a certain place in the international or the global division of labor. This is a society and economy, you know, that rests on the most savage exploitation and plunder of the people of the world. And we have a responsibility, an internationalist responsibility, to understand what the nature of this society is, what its role in the world is, and to make revolution. Because this society, this system, you know, is responsible for untold suffering in the world. So this is just the first point I want to make. You know, are we going to reconcile ourselves to this system and its horrors in the name of some kind of notion 
and you know I didn't hear any you know strategic you know sort of you know, carried through on this, but some kind of notion of community self empowerment and people you know deciding for themselves you know what they want at the grassroots level and organizers you know contributing to that and people changing you know their values and their relations to each other in these you know micro niches of community empowerment. Now this to me is unacceptable. It's unacceptable because A, as I said, it allows you know the system to continue to grind on and to grind up people. You know, again in the name of local democracy or mass or community democracy. It actually is a strategy, you know, tacit or formulated, it is a strategy to reside or exist in a state of permanent opposition, but not to actually confront the challenges and the need and the actual possibilities to transform society and the world. So this is my first point. There is a basis to bring a new society, a new economy, a new world into being. There is that basis in the development of human society on a global scale, in the socialized development of productive forces, in the know-how and technology that has been accumulated. Humanity can make a leap. Humanity can overcome scarcity. Humanity can create a social and economic structure with new values and a new outlook that can enable people to meet their most basic material needs, to enjoy a rich cultural and intellectual life, and to protect the ecosystems of this planet. We are facing an urgent ecological crisis. We are facing hunger. We are facing a world, as I said in the beginning, in which women are trafficked and veiled and subordinated and degraded. What are we going to do in the face of this. There is a strategy, there is an orientation for remaking society in the world. That is through revolutionary transformation. And this is the question of state power. Because we can talk about you know, enclaves, self-determination, but all of those will be existing as niches. All of those will be existing as local sites within a system that operates according to its logic of capitalist economics and its logic of world domination. So this is my first point. Where is the understanding, where is the orientation to actually change this system and to change it on the basis of an understanding of how it works and functions? And that involves the question of the state. The state is not a free-floating instrument of domination. The state, in any society, is an expression of class relations, of underlying economic relations. The state concentrates that. The dominant classes, which sit atop a certain set of production relations. That is a question of the state as an instrument of dictatorship. That is the case in any form of class society. So this is some opening remarks that I wanted to make about this. And as I said, I find it politically and morally unacceptable to articulate a strategy that allows this system to go on in the name of some kind of local self-determination. Second, the concept of leadership. You know, here, I mean, I, I want to say that I agree with a lot of what you're saying about the educators and the educated. And the fact is that there is a dialectic, I, I, my mouth is so dry, there is a dialectic between leading and learning. There is no leadership, communist leadership worthy of its name, that is not based on the understanding that you are learning while leading. And you are bringing forward new leaders. And you are striving at every step to overcome the division between leadership and led. This is why you need a vanguard party. This is what I was saying is the seeming paradox. That in order for the masses to rise up, to change and understand the world, to understand and change the world, they need scientific understanding. But this is something that is a transformative process for all, leadership and led. And yes, 
We cannot address the ecological crisis without learning from indigenous communities. I mean, I've been to India and Mexico and I've interacted with it. There is no way that we can go forward without learning from this. The model of socialist economy, sustainable socialist development that the Revolutionary Communist Party has put forward and developed is one that actually recognizes that we have to operate a, a modern industrialized economy on a whole different foundation. And that foundation cannot be one that soaks up the resources of the world. It cannot be a foundation that's based on produce, produce, produce. It's one that involves a sustainable interaction with the environment, that involves a profound interplay between centralization and decentralization. These are things you know, that we can talk about later. Now, the other point I want to make is, I mean, John, you came into this room and you, um, you know, started uh, <laughs> offering a critique of, quote, practice of the Revolutionary Communist Party. Now, this is a very, you know, kind of difficult discussion to have because, you know, you present this information, you know, as though it's authoritative. You present an analysis. I mean, you know, this is what, you know, I was down, you know, I can, you know, recount, you know, an episode or two. I was down there. The orientation and approach of the Revolutionary Communist Party is unity struggle, unity with people. That's point one. In other words, it's not the imposition of a position or a principle, you know, because there is this, quote, top-down enterprise, you know, that is heedless of people, of sensitivity, of sensibility, of inclination. It is a unity struggle, unity relationship. We enter into struggle in order to bring people an understanding of the underlying nature and dynamics of the system, to be learning from people, to be joining with people in fault line struggles such as Katrina and what happened in the Gulf. But we are entering into those struggles from the standpoint of building a movement for revolution and raising consciousness and bringing forward new revolutionaries, new revolutionary forces. And we are learning through this whole process. Now, you know, I, you know, as I said, this is a very difficult kind of discussion to have, you know, where you present this kind of information. You know, I no doubt that people make mistakes in their questions or style, but this is what I'm going to tell you, that we are involved in all kinds of struggles around mass incarceration, around the fight for abortion rights, against pornography. We are working in broad avenues of society. <laughs> huh? No, I'm just saying that we have an approach to this, and we are doing this as part of building a movement for revolution, but there are people who are not involved in revolution, not interested in revolution, who are part of these movements. This is something that we understand, and we are not seeking to, quote, impose our will. We are seeking to influence the direction of these struggles and movements and to help people understand the way this system operates and the way out and to bring forward a vision of a new world. And this is what Avakian's new synthesis is about. So this is um, in terms of a new world and how you know, we can create a society worthy of our humanity. And then the last point I want to make the last point I want to make and, um, is um, the question of ethos and the imaginary. This is very important in building a movement for a revolution, to bring forward new values and a new way that people relate to each other. That we are not talking about kind of an instrumentality, an engine of struggle that is somehow shorn of, bereft of, you know, issues of values and outlook and how people feel and interact with each other. We are, in the struggles that we're involved in, bringing forward new values, modeling new morality. And this is all part of you know, building this movement for revolution. It's a very critical element of There's an ideological struggle that has to be waged in society. I don't agree with your definition of ideology, but that's another question. Um, but there is struggle to be waged you know, over male chauvinism, over racism. There's a question of how people do work in cooperative and collective ways as part of building this movement for revolution. And these are seeds of something new and different. But these seeds, and even what you're describing, where there are these kinds of new phenomena, new, new shoots, if you will, of ways in which people can relate, these can only be actualized. These can only be meaningful in relation to a struggle 
to change society, its economic, its political, its social, and its ideological relations. Because this system, as we learned, and that was my example about the 60s, where there were tremendous things that happened, but as long as this system stays on, and power remains in the hands of this ruling class, all of this will be crushed, will be marginalized, will be absorbed back into the system, and we are in need of something more and beyond being in a state of permanent opposition and being in a state of organizing at the grassroots in a society that feasts on the world. Thank you very much. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I understand. I'm going to try to be brief. I know uh, we want to give the audience a lot of time to talk. Uh, ideology is a system of ideas that purports to be a description of reality, but in fact, systematically distorts reality on behalf of some system of power. Or some That's my definition. It's sort of a critical theory definition of ideology. But uh, one of the things that uh, is so telling is when people don't hear something, what they don't hear, when they don't notice something, you know, this is what psychoanalysis is about and so forth. Um, okay, one thing I wanted to say was that uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, what happened in the Gulf. I'm not concerned with what happened in the Gulf. I'm concerned with what's happening in the Gulf. What's, what? I just, what's happening in the yeah, Gulf. Yeah. Uh, my son has a friend with a shrimp boat. Mm. My son wanted to work for his friend on the shrimp boat. They're probably not going to go out into the Gulf. The, 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 the life forms are collapsing. The seafood industry is collapsing. We're still there. That's why I'm unprincipled. I'm just a neighbor, community member, working for the survival of my community. And I take it very seriously. And there's a certain resentment of local people when other people come in and do not take their problems seriously. It's something local people get mad about. So it's what tribal people get mad about. It's what working class people get mad about. It's what 10th generation New Orleanians get mad about uh, when their son can't work on a shrimp, shrimp boat, which is a traditional thing in Louisiana. Uh, what I was, well, okay, morally unacceptable, not giving a picture of where to go. Part two of my talk, which I didn't get to, was a history of all of this. If we wanted to investigate this issue, I don't want to do rhetoric. I'm just going to say there is a project that's worth, worth taking on, a study of the history of the world, a study of the history of social change, a study of the history of revolutions. You have to study the French Revolution, the Paris Commune, the Russian Revolution, the early stages of the Russian Revolution, the revolution in the Ukraine, Kronstadt, we could spend the whole time debating Kronstadt, no doubt, the Mexican Revolution, the Spanish Revolution, which is the major uh, uh, anarchist point of reference. I'm a member of the IWW, as you heard. It's not a view that says just let things happen. I mean, there's an idea of taking over the means of production and self-managing them. We do have ideas, by the way. Uh, I'm a, 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 an admirer of, of the Gandhian movement. If anybody's really interested in Gandhianism, I have an article which is going to be part of this book on the, the libertarian anarchist, strongly anarchist dimensions of, of the, the Gandhian movement and a lot of misconceptions about what it was and also about the shortcomings, particularly uh, the lack of militancy and ultimately using direct action uh, more, than, more than it did. But, but uh, there's a lot of practice there. Uh, we didn't talk about affinity group organization, base communities. I spent 20 years, I was really the closest person to a guy named Murray Bookchin who developed a theory called libertarian municipalism. I still write stuff called social ecology. For 20 years, and one of the reasons why I broke with him is because it became too programmatic. I could give you the perfect answer to how to save the world. I could do just what you did, but give you the libertarian version of it, the anarcho-communist version of it, and we could go back and forth on this. But ultimately I decided it was idealism, because it was a program that was not connected with what would actually change the society. So it ended up that bookchinism or libertarian municipalism consists of small groups of members of a political sect who have a great ideology which says if only everybody would do what Bookchin tells you to do in this book or what this pamphlet tells you to do, it would change the world. 
I mean, I had a friend in the IWW who told me the only reason why we haven't taken over the means of production is we haven't had a chance to explain to every member of the working class how the IWW works. But it, that's not true. It's just not true. That's ideology. We have to have a practice that will really transform people, transform communities, and then when the time comes, we will be ready. That's it. I hope it was five minutes. I didn't want to take over five minutes.